Hi, everybody. For this episode, we're joined by Sarah Mangan. She is the Positive Community Norms Grant Coordinator with REACH Programs in Minnesota and the United States. She holds two master's degrees, is a certified health coach, a behavior change specialist, a certified personal trainer, and she's even a yoga instructor. All that's very impressive, but what I find most endearing is that her kindness and gratitude are contagious. Sarah, it's super exciting to have you as a guest on the podcast. Thank you for joining us. So much for having me, Paul. I'm really excited to be here. Great. You're relatively new to working with young people. Most of your human experiences has been working with adults. How did you come to take the leap into youth work? I'm so grateful to have this experience. Like you said, I've had a history in the adult services, human services working world, and I got an opportunity to be the Positive Community Norms Grant Coordinator for REACH Programs, which is a youth adult partnership happening in Cloquet, Minnesota. So I feel like universe aligned and I just got this really cool opportunity. Yeah. How different is it working with young people now that you're doing it after working with adults most of your life? Not as different as I expected. In a lot of ways, I feel like people are people. And being able to see their humanity at every phase of their personal development, uh, that's a place that I can find the common ground. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And... I know that you did a lot of work in chemical dependency with adults mm -hmm. and mental health and things of that nature, but why did you choose getting into chemical dependency and helping people in the first place when with all these degrees and all these things that you do, you could be uh, pursuing different careers in a multitude of avenues, but yet you chose helping people. Why is mm -hmm. that? Well, the real truth is all of the degrees, all of the stuff happened after I got sober. So mm. it wasn't until I had recovery that any of that was possible for me. And it felt really important to give back something that saved my life, you know, to continue to offer that to people who are still suffering. Can you talk a little bit about your addiction? Uh, how, how did that come to be? And how did you... Uh get into that life where you were using chemicals and getting uh, drunk a lot. How did that yeah. come to be? Well, it, <laughs> it happened slowly, fits in stages. Uh, I shared with you the last time we talked, the first time I drank alcohol, I got in trouble. So, and serious consequences. So um, really when I think back, my drinking history was relatively brief, but it was really an attempt to, uh, connect to find comfort in myself and in in the world um it didn't work out <laughs> as we also discussed that wasn't that wasn't the way that i would ultimately find connection with people but it was part of it was the way i got there yeah to feel connected did you feel disconnected as a young person yeah, I felt pretty isolated um, in my own mind, I would say. I think there were a lot of people around me. My family is amazing. Um, you know, my parents have been married for 45 years. So it, like, you know, there were folks around. It was, it was mostly just feeling alone, whether that was true or not, you know. I wonder why that was. You you were a smart person. You were in accelerated classes. Mm -hmm. You were involved in athletics. You were a gymnast. Why do you think you still felt disconnected? Um, well, I think with, you know, uh, the, the mind of an adult, I can look back on that now and say, well, these were the factors of what was occurring. I can also see a person who had the beginnings of an undiagnosed mental illness, an eating disorder, a desire to be accepted and a fear that that would never happen if people like really knew who I was. So there was a lot of attempts at masking to look like everything was okay, but that felt so incongruent with what was going on inside, if that makes sense. Mm. 
Yeah, a little bit. I, I'm just trying to get it. What is it about yourself that you felt uncomfortable? Can you I label mm-hmm. that? Maybe not. You couldn't at the time, but can you now label what made you feel like you weren't uh, belonging? So we talked a little bit about this last time. I think I grew up was born in the early '80s, kind of came came of age in the '90s, and there wasn't a lot of diversity in our media in our in, and I grew up in a very small town all the people were white everyone had this heteronormative lens and so I didn't see myself reflected in that community or really anywhere but I couldn't name that you know so you can when you are small or what, even when we're grown you know you can go into a situation and maybe feel like yeah I belong here like these are my people and I really never kind of felt that like, oh yeah, here I am. I belong here. Yeah. When did you first start feeling that? Like at what point in your life did you get to a point where you say, now I feel like I, I'm being true to myself and people are accepting of me who I am. Mm -hmm. Well, I think I had the illusion of that with drinking and drugs, right? I thought Mm -hmm. I'm just going to like, let it all hang out. And if you hang around, you must accept me. You know, and that's not accurate either. But I think that 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 seems like, you know, when you drink, we lose our ability to have inhibitions that keep us safe, you know, and we make choices um, almost in an other than conscious way sometimes. Right. So in that in that drinking and stuff, it was okay for me to explore my sexuality, to ask hard questions, to. you know, question the constructs that we live with. And that I think when you're a young person and you're using drugs and alcohol, that feels really deep and really real. Um, And it was a gateway to being able to ask hard questions, get really deep and really real without having to numb my feelings through alcohol and drugs. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think it does. And so what I'm getting is that you had... A, a childhood that, you know, you had stability around you, but said something just wasn't right. And mm-hmm. you, it seemed like you're having a hard time putting your finger on what that was when you were young. When you I first experienced. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, I was thinking about this too, because I don't necessarily think it's any one thing, you know, in our society, we try to pinpoint like a problem and all yeah. of us live within systems, you know? So, And we face a diverse set of challenges in those systems, whether it's poverty or racism or sexism or whatever it is, like we're all in those systems. So I think that that plays a part that we sometimes can't even calculate. When you uh, first started drinking or experimenting with drugs, did you kind of get an instinct right away that you really like this stuff or was it something you grew into? Cause I know I've heard a lot of stories about people with chemical dependency problems. Mm-hmm. Like right away, it was mm-hmm. a light bulb went off. Mm-hmm. This is something I want to do more of. What was instantly, that like for you? Instantly. It was a feeling of freedom and release followed by disaster, which I could not wait to repeat. <laughs> Yeah. What is the disaster, Sarah? The disaster is the inevitable consequences that always accompanied my drinking. So if it's getting in trouble with my parents, getting arrested, you know, ruining relationships with people, there was always a price. It was never just the release and the freedom. It always had a cost. Mm, interesting. I bet that's true for a lot of people with chemical dependency problems is that there's the the, the benefits, but there's also the cons that go with yeah. it every, time. every I, time. I believe that's probably true. What were your parents like and how were they when you started uh, dabbling in alcoholism? Or what, uh, dabbling yeah. in alcoholism, but when you started <laughs> drinking. Yeah. That's really what happened. Um, so my parents are, like I said, am- amazing. They're two of the smartest people I know to this day. Um, they always wanted what was best. So when I started drinking, they were super concerned and wanted to cut that off immediately. So the consequences were swift and severe and, you know, never physical punishment, but, you know, it was just like a retraction of any freedom I had. And um, 
they made it clear that this was unacceptable. I was also informed probably around that time, like 15, 16 years old, that I have a lot of chemical dependency issues in my extended family, but lots of people mm. suffer from this and it's in my blood. It's in my genes and I better like keep an eye on it. I'm predisposed. So I also knew that really early on too. So I guess I didn't feel super surprised. It sort of felt like predestined, just like, yep, this is what we do um, in some sense, you know. So your parents were very involved, uh, took a very uh, intervention mm -hmm. kind of approach to trying to help you, but yet it didn't seem to work, right? Because no. um, all those restrictions of freedom and, uh, didn't seem to help. Um, did that sometimes make it worse? Um, it gave me something to push against, right? So it was like, oh, if I could just get away from them, then I'll be okay, right? When the real thing that I was pushing against was the disease of addiction. Like that is, once I started drinking and using, that became the axis around which my life revolved. Most important, only thing. So everything that got in my way was a barrier. And so I saw my parents' assistance, their love, their support as a barrier to what I really wanted. That also mm -hmm. turned out to be a false uh, thinking process. <laughs> well, I give your parents a lot of credit for stepping in. Uh, some mm -hmm. parents don't do that. Yeah. And um, was there a lot of friction between you and them when you were younger? Did it lead to a lot of dis you know, discomfort in the <sighs> environment of your home? And Oh, yes, of course, yeah. I think that it's got to be really hard. I don't have kids, but I cannot even imagine loving someone so much and watching them hurt themselves and not being able to help. Like, that must be such an awful feeling. So when I look back at that time, that's how I think about it now. Like, yes, of course, there was discord. Everyone felt powerless. Um, and, you know, so my solution was I'll just go. I'll just get out of here, and then I'm going to make it okay. For everyone but I kept coming home and like <laughs> that didn't work either did, just, did you run away I mean when you I say go well, I, I I did, was that just metaphorically or did you actually go somewhere I did well you know after high school which so I started really like drinking in earnest uh doing drugs when I was about 17 um senior year of high school wasn't awesome don't remember it very well um but after that, it was just like, I'll go. I'm out. And then I, you know, drove across the country with someone, I came home, did it again, came home. So, I mean, the thing I also think about is how blessed to have a place to come back to. That my parents didn't just say, you know what, go, figure it out. And no, you can't come back. Um, I probably wouldn't be speaking with you if, if that had been the case. You know, you talk about what a blessing, and I want to talk to you more about that later on in the podcast, but you are one of the most uh, grateful people uh, mm. I've ever run across, and it's so wonderful to hear those kinds of things come from you. Mm. When you were drinking, uh, we often hear people hit rock bottom. Mm. Uh, did you have an experience like that, that something that caused things to change for you in, in, a, in a big way? Yes. I think the rock bottom, it wasn't an isolated event. It, occurred, it was about a three-week period of time, but it was mm -hmm. getting a DUI, uh, which happened in February of 2002. Um, I hadn't had access to a vehicle for years uh, because my parents were smart enough not to give me access to a vehicle. Thank God. And so I had my roommate's car. I got a DUI, and I went to jail. And that was pretty uh, unexpected to say the least. I was, when I got pulled over, the cop asked me, have you been drinking? And I said, yeah, but I'm 21. And I, that's really, I was like, dude, I can drink legally. Like, what's your problem? And so that was the beginning of the end of my drinking. You know, my dad coming to pick me up from jail. Um, he wasn't even mad. He wasn't, even, he was just so deeply disappointed that like that was worse you know I really wanted him to just like yell at me or do something and he was 
disappointed, disgusted. And that kind of got my attention somewhere, Mm -hmm. you know. And it was about three weeks later that I uh, called him up and I said, I need help. And what did he do? He helped me. Oh, he was able to uh, help get me into detox and then into treatment. Um, he funded it, you know, and that saved my life. So, yeah. He sounds like a wonderful person. He's my hero. That's great. Well, kudos to your mom and dad for yeah. helping you through those uh, really tough times. I know they're and so I know, brave. Yeah, and I know also. In addition to this, you had mentioned you were exploring your sexuality. So, in addition to everything else was going on, you were trying to identify who you really were and, and what your sexuality really was. When did that all surface, and and when did that get to a point where you feel comfortable with who you are now? So I think it got kind of real, uh, like, oh, that's an option. Maybe when I was 16 years old, I didn't realize until that point that girls could kiss girls. And that, and then I got very excited to find that out. Um, when I went to college, you know, that was very uh, cliche. You know, I met someone, I was just like, oh, I can be myself here. Um, so it was probably after my first semester of college when I came home, I let my parents know, like, hey, I'm probably gay. And, like, I've known this, and I I just, like, need to tell you. So it was it was an interesting conversation. Yeah. And your parents are pretty religious, right? So <clears throat> some of these things are going against their religious beliefs, I got to believe. Right. So we were raised Catholic. My parents are Catholic, practicing. Um, part of being Catholic is an intense sense of responsibility to pass your faith along to your children. So my parents took that responsibility seriously. Um, you know, and my perspective on that has changed over time. Um, but I really do respect their faith. Um, it comes with a lot of rules that I don't agree with. Uh, and it is not my personal spirituality, but I see how it serves. Sarah, thank you for sharing all that. Uh, you really exposed yourself in a very personal sort of way. And I think it's really helpful for the listeners to be able to hear your story because it reminds us of what young people are going through when we're working with them. There's a lot of internal things happening yeah. and systems are bumping up against them. Their caregivers are bumping up against them. And it's a very turbulent time in people's lives. We do have to take a short break, but when we come back, I'd like to ask you a little bit more about your work and things you've experienced lately. So we'll be right back. And we're back. Sarah, right before the break, we were talking about all your courageous things you've gone through in your life and have turned out to be such a a wonderful person as a result of all this stuff. I I like to believe that all you've gone through is going to serve others really well. What do you think those experiences have taught you, and how can you use those experiences to give back to other people? Yeah. So you and I talked a little bit about this idea of being a lifelong learner, and when you uh, reviewed my resume, you might hear that in there. So learning has given me some freedom to put words to what happened and, and then help other people see themselves with a different perspective also, right? So what I've learned about is resiliency, and that's not personal to me, that's a human characteristic. I've learned about neuroplasticity, that we can literally change how our brains function to the better. We have control there. I have learned about how to engage our parasympathetic nervous system to induce relaxation on purpose. So I think these are real things that I needed uh, that I didn't know how to get and um, now I can share those those things with people, and it's it's pretty powerful. Yeah, it's wonderful that you're taking all that and turning it into a gift for others. 
And when we were getting to know each other, you were talking about you just are always looking for the best way to help other people. And that's probably why you have that long laundry list of things that you've accomplished so far in your life. (laughs) Where does that passion to help other people come from? Why are you so into making sure the world is a better place for other people? So I think this might be where I should give a shout out to Essence Blackmore. I listened to her podcast and it was amazing. And then mm-hmm. I come to find out that she's 22 and it's like, wow, 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 wow. Um, if I had known what she knows when I was 22, like, wow. So I don't know. Um, I just lost my train of thought because I really wanted to say that she inspired me a lot. Like, that's what it is. We're responsible. We really are responsible for one another. And I feel that comes in through my spirituality. And it also comes in from this perspective of like, every single person matters. We all have something like special and unique and it matters. And we are connected. And like, when we can get together and feel safe, man, that can change the world. Yeah. And I know you live for those moments. I can just tell. Yeah. I can hear it in your voice when we get to certain points in our conversation. I can see it in your face when we get to certain points is that your emotions and your realness and humanity are just at the surface all the time. Um, Has that ever been kind of a liability for you? Because I see it as like (laughs) such a benefit. But sometimes it must be hard to just be so open and transparent. Oh, well, see, the funny thing is, right, like, I can't put it away. And I think that is what sometimes, and maybe in my youth, made life really painful, right? I've been feeling in a big way for a long time. And I think it's really painful when you look around and you see so much suffering and so much injustice and people treating other people just so poorly it breaks my heart so i think that any opportunity that i personally have to lift someone up or to remind them that we are connected i i need to take that opportunity Mm -hmm. i'm wondering if there's a connection here and i just as i've been listening to you talk you know when you were doing drugs and alcohol there was that instant kind of high that instant kind of gratification that you'd get from that it feels like you get kind of that same buzz Mm. from helping other people, but this time in a very, you know, productive and healthy sort of way. Mm -hmm. Would you say there's a connection there? Are there any parallels whatsoever? Or am I just, you know, wishfully trying to tie two things together? I like it though. No, it's never really occurred to me on a conscious level, but I think the, the, the connection, the similarity is the sense of being alive. I am alive. When I connect with other people and we are in a moment together, I'm aware. And I think that that false, like that false sense of getting there um, with drugs and alcohol is very similar, right? And I talk to people for a long time when I provide a chemical dependency treatment, uh, like you can get there. You can get to that euphoric, blissed out place that you're looking for, but it just, it isn't instantly. It's a slow burn right? It's a spiritual connection, in my opinion. And there is something very similarly, like, exciting. So that's, that's a real interesting parallel. Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I do think that that is a big part of why a lot of youth workers get into this field is it's those moments that you get when you know a young person has learned something or that you're finally connecting with them on an emotional level. It is a shot of dopamine. It is an adrenaline rush to be able to feel like, ah, there's that moment I've been waiting for. And sometimes you have to work hours or days or weeks to get to that point with different young people. But when you get that moment, it just makes you want to come back for more. Yes. And I, think I see that in you. Um, because I, I can tell you get so much satisfaction and, um, personal gratification out of that. And I did say earlier in the podcast, I want to come back and talk about your gratitude. And Mm -hmm. I think that that is the one attribute that just strikes me so obvious about you and Mm -hmm. how grateful you are for 
just this opportunity to live life and to have these moments where you can share with other people. Mm. How, as somebody who went through so much struggle as a young person with alcoholism, dependency, all those kinds of things that you went through, uh, your sexuality, you came out as like the most grateful person I've ever met. Mm. How, why are you so grateful? Mm. <laughs> oh, Paul, thank you. Um, so every day, all these days, uh, are unexpected blessings. I didn't, I didn't think I was going to make it this long. I didn't think I'd be here. Um, recovery in its various forms has given me a second chance. And I remember that every day. So I think, you know, like I actually think gratitude is a superpower and it is a cultivated and intentional mindset. And I have spent years in an attempt to transform what has been painful into something that can be of use. And this is the vehicle. Gratitude is the vehicle through which that has occurred. Wow. And I think that's a beautiful lesson is that we can't predict what tomorrow is going to be, bring. And all we can do is be grateful for the moment that we have right now. For example, I'm very grateful to be talking to you right now and learning and and gaining insight from you. And your dog is also so very sorry. happy to be involved with the podcast. He was being so good. Oh, Paul, yeah. just a little longer. Um, yeah, I'm very grateful to be here. And most of the time, yeah. I'm after that dog. Do you want me to? Yeah, if you want to go move your dog, then we can again. finish off. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Okay. Oh, my sincere apologies. Well, that's okay. <laughs> Life happens. Yes. I'm grateful you had some place to put your dog. Seriously. <laughs> Seriously. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. So, Sarah, you are so grateful. And I'm wondering, do you use those lessons of gratefulness with the people you work with, uh, whether you are doing mental health counseling mm -hmm. Uh, drug and alcohol treatment for adults are now with young people. Do you share that kind of perspective about just be grateful for the moment we have right now? I absolutely try to. I think that um, it's pretty tough to really explicitly tell someone to be grateful, but I think we can model that behavior um, and we can talk about it. It's a change. Like I said, it's a change in perspective. So Instead of having to say, instead of saying, like, I have to do something, I can also say, I get to do this. I choose to do this. This is an opportunity. Um, and I think that just kind of reworking some of that language is, is absolutely something I bring into my work. That's great. It's got to be a wonderful lesson that you can share with other people. And sometimes when people are down on their luck or they're going through drug and alcohol treatment or young people who are struggling with their identity or yeah. just how they fit in or the circumstances that they're living in um, can feel like they're not grateful. They feel almost burdened uh, by life. And it's wonderful to give them that counter perspective. And I also don't want to say, I really, just to clarify quickly, you know, an attitude of gratitude is not a Pollyanna, like, there are no problems. It's a balance of hope and concern, right? Like, I am concerned. I worry. I am very concerned. <laughs> I am also simultaneously very grateful. So I, I don't want to suggest that, like, we should be grateful for all of the things and all the struggles all of the time. It's a process, and it ebbs and flows. It's definitely not a straight line. Good clarification. Yeah. Sarah, we're almost out of time together. It goes by so fast. Yeah. But I do want to thank you for all you pour into other people. Your heart and soul are 100% into this. Mm -hmm. And I'm so grateful that you've chosen to now make the leap into helping young people because yeah. I know that they're going to connect with you. I know they're going to feel 
your love and their, their gratitude that you have to offer. And I'm just so thankful that you're doing what you do. So thank you for thank you. helping other people. Right on. This has been such a neat opportunity. I'm really grateful to have been able to meet you and talk about it. Sarah, at the end of each episode, I ask our guest, what words of wis- wisdom or inspiration would you like to leave with the listeners? So what words of wisdom or inspiration would you like to leave with the listeners? We're all in this together. You are not alone and we are safer in connection. So reach out. Great. 